technological thrillers are part of a very liminal genre. They sit in a twilight zone between action, cinema, and science fiction. By the way, I'm not going to argue about whether the movies I talk about in this video are science fiction or not, because I reckon they are. Technological thrillers have been popular with audiences since Ufa and Fritz Lang gave us movies like Spione and Dr. Mabusa the Gambler in the 1920s. The genre continued with 1939's Q Planes, also known as Clouds Over Europe, and in the 50s, Gog and the novels of Ian Fleming kept the subgenre alive. But from Dr. No onwards, the 60s were the decade when science fiction really merged with the thriller. So here are five of my favourite 1960s science fiction technological thrillers. I'm doing these chronologically, so let's get started. Technological thrillers are also about technological fears, and this one, paralleling the plot of the much more satirical Dr. Strangelove, gives us a techno-thriller as a nuclear nightmare. I say 60 million is perhaps the highest price we should be prepared to pay in a war. Oh, what's the difference between 60 million dead and 100 million? 40 million. Norad computer systems misidentify an off-course civilian airliner as an unknown intruder into US airspace. After bombers are scrambled, the alert is cancelled, but one bomber group doesn't get the message due to radio jamming by the USSR. Those bombers continue towards Moscow. The US president, played by Henry Fonda, his interpreter Buck, played by Larry Hagman, and the Soviet leadership, whom we never see, work together to try to avoid nuclear annihilation. Mistakes are made on both sides, and one bomber continues toward Moscow after the others are successfully stopped. It will drop two 20 megaton bombs on Moscow. Jay? Yes, Mr. President. You might hear the sound of the engines just before the bombs drop. Maybe not. In any case, you'll hear the defensive missiles going off. Right after that, the bombs will explode. Ultimately, the president has to make a decision that more than any other scene in 1960s cinema shows us the power given to the leaders of nations with nuclear weapons and the consequences and responsibilities that come with that power. The supporting cast is solid too. Dan O'Hurley here as an Air Force Brigadier General. Walter Matthau as a Henry Kissinger type of character. And we even get Dom DeLuise in a serious role. They give us a tight, nightmarish science fiction what-if scenario with a distressingly logical conclusion. Failsafe was remade as a live-to-screen telly movie in 2000 with a really good cast. I haven't seen the telly movie, but the stark black and white original is something very special. There's a criterion edition of this movie for very good reasons. If you want something similar but a bit different, you can check out the 1965 movie The Bedford Incident starring Richard Widmark and Sidney Poitier. That's pretty good too. Based on and drastically changed from Alistair MacLean's 1962 novel, the Satan Bug is a gloriously widescreen techno thriller starring George Maharis, Richard Basehart, Anne Francis, and Dana Andrews. I'm George Maharis, and this is the Satan Bug. It's kept him there, beyond those doors, but you can't get in. It's top secret. George Maharis, who ventured into big screen movies after a successful run in Route 66, plays Lee Barrett, a former intelligence officer turned private eye who was recruited to help locate a vial of the Satan bug, a virus virulent enough to destroy all life on Earth, not just human life, but all life, in a matter of months. The virus has been stolen from a secret bioweapons lab in the Southern California desert by one of the scientists. The scientists, two henchmen, Veretti and Donald, played by Ed Asner and Frank Sutton, put one of the vials into a secret location in the desert with a time-release device. The scientist himself has the other one. The government authorities give Barrett a partner, his old flame Anne, played by Anne Francis, and together the two of them track down the scientist and the vials. Biological warfare was a growing concern in the 1960s. News reports and documentaries made the public aware of the arms race between the US and Russia to see who could build a better bug. The Satan bug moves along really well. John Sturgis was one of the best American action directors of his day. I like George Maharis too, he was a competent leading man whose career was unfortunately adversely affected by his sexuality. You might want to watch closely when you see this movie, because James Doohan from Star Trek, James Hong and Lee Remick show up in small roles. 
Kino Lorber put out a nice Blu-ray release of this movie a couple of years ago, so it's more accessible than it's ever been. This is a wonderfully silly movie. The USA and the USSR have developed a technology for shrinking the atoms of people and things, but only for one hour. The guy who figures out how to make the shrinking indefinitely long acquires an inoperable blood clot in his brain during an assassination attempt by Russian agents. So a submarine with a laser cannon on board is sent into this guy's bloodstream to zap the clot out of his brain. This science fiction concept screams 1960s has got laser beams, Russian sleeper agents and submarines. It's peak 1960s. We get Beefcake Irishman Stephen Boyd as Agent Charles Grant, who was there for no real reason. Arthur O'Connell and Raquel Welsh as scientists, Donald Pleasance as the navigator anatomist, and William Redfield as the pilot. And guess which one is the Russian spy? This is a deeply silly movie that takes itself a little too seriously. The science is so bad that I've seen a nine-year-old pick it apart. Like what happens to the submarine and the gallons of saline solution they injected into Dr. Benner's after the hour's up. Raquel Welsh and Stephen Boyd are good eye candy, but all the characters are flatter than onion skin. The sets and special effects were state-of-the-art at the time, and they still have a wonderful retro charm about them. In 1966, nobody had seen anything like Fantastic Voyage before. It was groundbreaking when it came to science fiction special effects work, while still being a Cold War spy drama at a very simplistic level. One of the other interesting things is that the musical score by Leonard Rosenman doesn't start in the film until the submarine enters Dr. Benner's body. That's a nice little artistic choice there. The movie remains influential too. There have been talks about remakes and sequels for decades. At various times, James Cameron, Paul Greengrass and Guillermo del Toro were working on rebooting the movie. Nothing's yet happened about it, but with the kind of money streaming services are throwing around right now, I wouldn't be entirely surprised if something pops up in the next few years as far as a remake or a sequel is concerned. Joe Dante's 1987 Inner Space took the concept further, of course, but Fantastic Voyage, for all of its silliness and soullessness, remains a pioneer in high-concept science fiction thriller filmmaking. This movie gets on the list for two reasons. One, I first saw it as part of a Saturday matinee when I was a kid. And as we all know, nostalgia is the second strongest force in the universe after Dave Bautista. Secondly, the concept behind this film is insane, paranoid and wonderfully gonzo. Filmed in England but set in the USA, Battle Beneath the Earth gives us Cohen Matthews as Jonathan Shaw, an army officer who is told by an ostensibly insane scientist, Arnold Kramer, played by Peter Arnold, who was always fun to watch that a rogue Chinese general is digging tunnels between the People's Republic of China and the USA. He plans to take nukes through these tunnels and destroy major American cities from beneath. This is Cold War paranoia and xenophobia taken to 11. Being a 1960s English movie with Chinese characters in it, you know that Yellowface is going to be involved and that most of the Asian characters are played by white people with plastic epicanthic folds who are cosplaying Warner Olin's Charlie Chan. My dear Chai, when will you learn that logic is the American god? Without the logic, we cannot function. We also get Earl Cameron and Ed Bishop in minor roles, a really bombastic movie score by Ken Jones, and the usual stock footage of American cities to give it a little bit of verisimilitude. Nothing about Battle Beneath the Earth is logical, believable, or plausible, but it's entertaining in a deeply old-fashioned way if you can put aside the casual racism, the limited budget, and the obvious English locations. It's dumb fun, and it's a bit of a what-the-f movie. Some of my sources say this movie came out in 1979, others in 1970, but because I didn't put it into my 1970 science fiction movie list, I'm adding it here. Colossus the Forbum Project is the first feature film about the technological singularity. That theoretical point in time at which technological growth becomes uncontrollable and irreversible resulting in unforeseeable changes in human civilization. In this case Charles Forbin played by Eric Braden is the chief designer of Colossus a project to computer control the nuclear weapon systems of the USA taking human fallibility and frailty out of the equation. 
Colossus is built into a mountain with its own nuclear reactor. It's self-repairing, self-improving and impervious to attack. It's surrounded by fields of intensified gamma radiation and other countermeasure devices. The JFK-like president, played by Gordon Pinsent, gives the okie doke and they light the blue touch paper on the project. Colossus immediately tells them that there's another system guardian, which the USSR put together at roughly the same time. That's when things escalate quickly, and the movie brings the audience along in a way that could be a masterclass in how to do info dumps. Information, action and plot progress really fast in a tight 10 minutes that starts around the 28 minute mark of the movie. Colossus and Guardian communicate, the communication is cut by the authorities, and when the two systems demand to be reconnected, shit gets real. The cast is pretty good. Braden, who later went on to spend decades in soap opera, is charismatic and intelligent as Forbin. Susan Clark as Dr. Cleo Markham, who, of necessity, becomes Forbin's love interest, is really good too. She was always such an underrated and underused actress. You might want to check her out in Arthur Penn's 1975 detective flick Night Moves. She is as good as Gene Hackman is in that movie. In the ensemble cast, you also see Marion Ross, who went on to be in Happy Days, George Stanford Brown, William Shallot, who plays the head of the CIA, and the ubiquitous James Hong. The movie's extrapolations on 1960s, 1970s technology are really groovy. Video phones, wall screens and the incredibly well-designed set of the Colossus control room with the stop matrix displays and chunky computer terminals really sells the story. Based on a series of novels by D.F. Jones, this is a movie about the end of human sovereignty. Before Colossus the Forbin Project, movies threatened AI takeovers, most notably in films like The Invisible Boy. But Colossus pays off. There's no deus ex machina, no sudden brilliant revolution. Ultimately, this film is a cautionary tale about human responsibility for the things we create. There is a Blu-ray release of this, and it's definitely worth having in your collection. Thank you very much for watching. As always, please consider subscribing, liking, and leaving a comment. Tell me which 1960s techno thrillers you liked, and why you liked them. You can also support the channel by going to patreon.com slash paleocinema. Over the next few videos, I'm going to be looking at other aspects of 1960s science fiction movies, so stay around for that. And in the meantime, watch some good movies, watch some bad movies, watch some 1960s science fiction movies, and I'll catch you next time. This is the voice of world control. I bring you peace. It may be the peace of plenty and content, or the peace of unburied death.